Samuel did millennia ago, we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are open and receptive so that we are changed and transformed into your likeness through your word today. Bless us as a community of believers. In the community of faith we pray. May all the people say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Sabbath. Oh, let's try it again. Happy Sabbath. Oh, yeah, there we are. You got to act like you're happy to be here. Amen. I'm happy to be here. The children have been happy all week long, and you got a chance to see what we've done. And it has been a blessing and a joy to work with the children. And I am so proud of this church for how they rally around young people and the programs that they're able to put on, the dedication, the hours, the sacrifice. And it was an awful lot of fun, too. So uh, next year for VBS, if you guys are uh, willing to take on a little challenge, come on and volunteer. Be a part of the crew. Be a part of the uh, adventure of helping chi- uh, children understand and know Jesus. want to welcome those online uh, watching. I know some from distant states have uh, joined us, and we're glad that you're here with us, as well as those who may be sick and shut in, unable to come and be with us. We're glad that you're able to worship with us in this way. I want to thank uh, my head elder, Albert, in a very special way for taking the service last week. Appreciate so much you filling in and bringing us the Word of God. I was watching online myself and enjoyed the worship service with all of you. Uh, So our media ministry is a real blessing to the church. So thanks to Alex and David and the crew, Samuel, uh, all of you for making that possible and stand too for our audio. Appreciate every one of you. This week we begin a new series for the summer from Psalms 23 called Rest for the Stressed. Anybody here feeling a little stressed? I don't know. Is, is stress a problem for you? All right. Uh, I, I want to tell you that you've come to the right place <laughs> to find some relief, some rest uh, for the stressed. And we're going to be looking at that um, systematically over the next few weeks. If you'll take out, I want you to just look at something with me, your study guide in the um, program that you have. The study guide. There should be one every week. And in particular, I'm going to point you to the back side because on the back side, of course, you have the words to our theme song, Speak, O Lord, but you'll notice at the bottom, we always have the scriptures cited. So the scriptures that we talk about during the course of the message are there for you to look up on your own later, but also you'll see there's a feature called Time Out with the Shepherd. And I'm going to try to make that a regular feature throughout this series. And those are some action points that you can take home with you to interact with the message that you heard today. Um, Spend some quiet time, reflecting time with the Lord in your personal devotion, your personal prayer life. And use those things to help let the message sink deeper in uh, through the week after we're gone from our fellowship today. All right? The front side, of course, is there for you to take notes. Whatever happened to hope? Whatever happened to hope? Now that may seem to you like a strange question to ask in church where hope is supposed to be one of our main products, right? If the church were a business and had product lines to offer its clientele, hope would be one of the main products products offered, right? Right? Talk back to me. Yes. Okay. You don't walk into McDonald's and ask whatever happened to hamburgers or walk into Starbucks and ask whatever happened to coffee. So why in a church where believers in Jesus gather to worship the God of hope through songs of hope, words of encouragement, prayers of faith, and promises of peace, why do I ask, whatever happened to hope? Consider with me the fact that hope is an endangered species today. Even inside the house of hope, many of us 
If we're honest, fight daily battles with panic and distress over what in the world is going on. I used to think of literal heart attacks when I read Jesus' prophecy about men's hearts failing them for fear over those things that were coming upon the earth, Luke 21, 26. But today, I see it more as people losing heart and the will to live due to what we would call fear attacks or hope attacks. Anxiety is the new currency in America among this generation. Anxiety is driving our suicide rate to a 30% increase. I was reading online that according to a report released by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, In 2015, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, claiming the lives of almost 45,000 Americans every year. Let me put that in perspective for you. This is a picture of Angels Stadium. I chose Angels Stadium instead of our own uh, Mariners Stadium because Mariners Stadium holds about 47,000 people, but Angels Stadium in Anaheim, California holds almost exactly 45,000 people. So just to give you a perspective, Angels Stadium full of people kill themselves by their own hand every year. Now I want you to think about the impact if that was any other kind of situation. If there were terrorist attacks in the United States where a stadium full of people were wiped out every single year, do you think that would get some attention? But because it's slow and because it's one at a time, maybe we don't feel the impact of it so much. But interestingly enough, After a decline in the suicide rate in the 80s and 90s, now it's peaking again, and especially among one particular group, and that is teenage girls or early teen girls between the ages of 10 and 14. Now, although they make up a small portion of the total suicide rate for this particular group, They have tripled in the last 15 years. What in the world could be causing such young people to fall into such a state of despair that they would think that there is no hope, no place for them on this earth, and they are better off dead than alive? What circumstance could take place in that age group? Well, there's a lot of factors, and the psychologists and the talking heads will tell you a lot of things. One of our elders just this week told me of a family member in the prime of life who took her life this week. And just last year, we invited Cherie Peters to come and counsel with young people on the campus of Auburn Academy. And she showed me, after a night of counseling with a young lady, a rope that that young lady had considered ending her life with just that week. I praise the Lord, Cherie was there and there was an intervention. But she took that rope as a trophy of God's grace, but also as a sobering reminder to us of the troubles that our young people are enduring. And so I ask, whatever happened to hope? I read a story this week also that helps me answer this question. It's about a painting. Maybe you've heard this story. A pastor in Houston, Texas, encountered uh, this painting years ago. The picture depicted an old, burned-out mountain shack. And after the fire, the family's sole possessions were destroyed. 
and the picture shows only a chimney that remains standing in front of this devastated pile of smoking timber stood an old man dressed only in his undergarments and there's a young boy by his side surveying the devastation. It was evident by the boy's distressed expression on his face that he had been crying. At the bottom of the painting, the artist added a caption with the words that he believed the old man was saying to the boy. And this simple sentence described the man's faith and hope for the future despite his dire circumstances. And the caption simply read, Hush, child, God ain't dead. Hush, child, God ain't dead. And it's a reminder, isn't it? We all need reminders that there is hope in this world. In the midst of all of life's troubles and failures, we need mental pictures to hold on to to remind us that even if the shack is burned down, even if the bills are due, the surgery is scheduled, the marriage is on life support, the prodigals have yet to come home, even if the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Why? Because God ain't dead. The Lord is still our shepherd. And because he is there is hope for the hopeless and rest for the stressed. Amen? Amen? Summer, as you know, is the season of travel and vacations. People are thirsty for a change of scenery after a long winter and at the end of a long school year. So I thought that we could all use both a spiritual and emotional vacation. A road trip. And I propose that our road trip is through the 117 words of an old familiar rest stop. And that's the 23rd Psalm. Six simple verses that contain a timeless formula for rest for the stressed. Sometimes it's so familiar to us we miss some of the deep that's involved. The Bible on this table is open to Psalms 23. It's a favorite. We recite it to those who are dying. We are, it, it's a common thing that we share in hospital rooms. Most people, even if they aren't regular church attenders, know the 23rd Psalm or have heard it. It has been used to give comfort to people for centuries. But because it's so familiar, sometimes you say the words and you don't even connect with what's really happening. The imagery that David, the, psalm, the shepherd king, put in those words to give a picture of God. What is God like? Well, this is going to be our summer vacation, our summer teaching series. And for the next few weeks, we'll spend some focused time with the shepherd. Is that all right? Focus time with the shepherd along paths of righteousness and find rest for our souls along with the answer to the question, whatever happened to hope. Are you ready for the journey? Are you sure? <laughs> it begins now. Let's read it together from the screen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. In these six compact but beautiful verses, David, himself a shepherd, who knew firsthand the relationship of sheep stressed, here they are. Number one, he rests me. Number two, he leads me. 
He restores me. He guides me. He comforts me. He welcomes me. He blesses me. Seven distinct actions of God that result in rest. And because of these seven God actions, David makes three life affirmations in these three simple stanzas of the song. And they are these. I have everything I need, verses 1 to 3. I have nothing to fear, verses 4 and 5. I have a home with God, verse 6. I would admonish you, if you are of the kind who marks your Bible, that you would take Psalms 23 and highlight it in just this three-part breakdown. In my Bible, you see I have colors orange, purple, and yellow. The first two, verses 1 and 2, I have in orange. Verses 4 and 5, I have in purple. And verse 6, I have in yellow. And I have them labeled. I have everything I need. I have nothing to fear. I have a home with God. Amen? I would encourage you to mark your Bible similarly. It will help you as we go through our lesson study. And yet all of these, these three affirmations from David flow out of the opening thesis statement in verse 1, which is the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Everything that follows hangs on this opening testimony. The Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd. This is very personal. This is not the Lord is a shepherd. The Lord is not the good shepherd. The Lord is not the shepherd of the world. Although he is all of those things, David doesn't express it that way. It's personal. The Lord is my shepherd. My personal shepherd. I have a relationship with with him and because he's my shepherd I lack nothing do you believe sitting here this morning that you lack nothing think about that I know that was a good amen line it was a line that begged for an amen, amen. okay but I want you to think about it do you, sitting here this morning, believe in your spirit and in your heart that because the Lord is your shepherd, you lack nothing? Because if you believe that the Lord is your shepherd, and if you believe that you lack nothing, my friends, you should be full of hope. You should be brimming, overflowing in hope, overflowing in joy, right? Right? overflowing in peace. Now I go back to how we started. Whatever happened to hope, we admitted that even in the house of hope, even in the church of God, we wrestle and struggle, what? To find peace. We wrestle with anxiety. So there is somewhat of a contradiction, isn't there? Because we wrestle and struggle with sometimes hopelessness, despair, we're all anxious, we're all eaten up inside with worry, and yet we've just declared and said amen to the Lord is my shepherd, and I lack nothing. So there's some processing that needs to be done, amen? There's some processing that needs to happen, and that's what we're here to do over the next several weeks. There is rest for my stress when I know the Lord as my shepherd. And here in the psalm, David is speaking through the mouth of the sheep. He is placing himself in the posture of the sheep, and he's the one boasting about his shepherd. Because just like there are good shepherds, there are bad shepherds. And... 
Some shepherds don't feed the sheep regularly. Some shepherds don't lead them out to green pastures. They'll let the sheep gnaw on the grass until it's just down to, to dirt and they're exposed to parasites. Some shepherds don't lead their, their sheep to fresh, still water where they can be refreshed. And so some sheep look emaciated. Some um, are, are full of scabs from um, insects and other things that have attacked the sheep, and the shepherd hasn't taken care of those wounds. So this sheep, if you can picture it in your mind, is a fat sheep. It is a well-cared-for sheep. He is rested. He is well taken care of. His wounds have been attended to. He's been well fed. He's been led to green pastures. He's, he's drank from still water. He's in a good place. He's standing in a pasture of green grass. And he's looking across the fence at his neighbor who unfortunately is in the hands of a poor shepherd and he is sickly and he's thin and his ribs are showing and he's not so well taken care of and David personified by the well taken care of sheep boasts and says I'm sorry for you but the Lord is my shepherd <laughs> and I, I lack nothing Everything I need, he has provided. It is um, a, a, a positive, tender relationship that he has with the shepherd. And I know the Lord not as my, my good luck charm, charm, not as a Santa Claus, not as a genie or some kindly grandpa, but no, my shepherd, one who has complete charge of my life. And he's not just any shepherd. I have the Lord as my shepherd. The Lord. David here uses the personal name of God, Yahweh. I want you to know that name is so holy that if the name needed to be written down, the scribes would take a bath before writing it and then destroy the pen afterwards. Yahweh, the personal name of God. It's difficult to define. The name refers to the fact that God is who he is. He's the one who causes everything else. He is unchanging, the one who inhabits eternity, the one who is always present, always present to provide, always present to protect. Always present to abide with me. That's my shepherd. The one who is and the one who causes to be. What is it that you need this morning? God is that. He causes that to be. He causes things that were not to be named as though they were. Because that's the kind of God that he is. Many of you here are miracles because of the action and the grace of the shepherd. You didn't expect to be here today. You, years ago, you would have never conceived yourself to be in church on a Saturday morning. Among Seventh-day Adventists. Really? Couldn't conceive of that. But your shepherd... who is and who causes to be, has led you as a good shepherd to this place where you can find rest for the stressed. And yet this is the name God David chooses in the opening verse of Psalm 23. The great I am is my shepherd. This is very similar in thought to Psalm 8 where we read, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name, right, in all the earth. O Lord, Yahweh, our Lord. He is other than us, and yet he's ours. He is powerful, and he is personal. He is majestic, and he is mine. He is a consuming fire, and yet he is my sensitive shepherd. You've got to love the image of Yahweh as shepherd in Isaiah 40, verse 11, where it says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. That's our shepherd. He carries us close to his heart so that we can feel his heartbeat. 
When I woke up this morning, one of the first prayers that I offered to God, I said, Lord, this morning I need a shepherd. And I need you to hold me close so that I can feel your heart beating against mine. And that's all I want to do. That's all I want to do is just be in your presence. Just be in your arms. Let you be God. Let me be the sheep. But be my shepherd today. And sometimes that's what we need, right? To be carried like the lambs in his arms. I want you to know that this psalm, the 23rd psalm, flies in the face of deism, the belief that God created life and then took his hands off, and we're here on our own. That God is not involved in what happens on a day-by-day basis. The simple shepherd psalm exposes the lie of an impersonal God. The Lord not only created me, but he shepherds me. And because he does, and to the extent that I allow him, I have everything I need. If I have God, what could I possibly lack? A substitute Sabbath school teacher once asked the class one day, how many of you can quote Psalm 23? Several of the children raised their hands, including a little girl who was only about four years old. The teacher was surprised that someone so young would know the 23rd Psalm, so he asked her to recite it to the class. She stood up and said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. (laughs) Now, she had the words just a little mixed up, but she understood the message completely. That's all I want. Life is stressful. There's no denying it. But to the extent that the Lord is your shepherd is the extent of your ability to find rest even in the midst of stress. Amen? That's what it's got to be. Some of us think that the only time we can have peace is if the stressful circumstances in our lives have been removed. Right? That thing that's causing you to lose sleep at night, that thing that causes you pain, that thing that causes you to weep and cry when no one else is looking, right? We think the only way that we're ever going to have the peace that passes understanding is when the circumstance that's making us hurt changes. And that's not how the shepherd shepherds us. He shepherds us in the midst of the storm. In the midst of the valley of the shadow. And there we're able to find rest even while the chaos is going on around us. That's when the Lord is your shepherd. Too often we act like sheep without a shepherd though. In the words of Philip Keller who authored the book A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23... He wrote this, he said, they seem to hope that by merely admitting that he is their shepherd, somehow they will enjoy the benefits of his care and management without paying the price of forfeiting their own fickle and foolish way of life. Now, does that describe any of us? Does that sound remotely familiar to anybody? That we think That we can have the care and management of the shepherd, but hold on to our our way? Because sometimes, right, we think that our way is the best way. We have to help God out a little bit. He obviously doesn't understand what I'm going through. He doesn't understand the complexities of my situation. So me, in my infinite wisdom, I've got the best plan, and I need to help God out sometimes. No shepherd means stress with no rest. And we've got a whole world that is experiencing this right now. Stress without rest. Too busy to lie down in green pastures. Schedule too tight to drink from still waters. Life too full for a restored soul. So we make do with a do-it-yourself patched up soul. A duct taped soul. It's that scene where Jesus saw the multitude and had compassion on them because he said they were as sheep without what? Without a shepherd. And that's a very accurate picture of life today. 
Look at the people in the grocery store next time you're shopping. Look in their faces. Try to make eye, try to make eye contact. Okay? Look at the cars next to you in traffic on the 405. That can be scary. Be sure you look nice. Don't look mean because you might get shot. Okay? But try to look at the people in the cars next to you. Look at the people in the cubicle next to yours at work or in the waiting room at the doctor's office or waiting in line for a a prescription in the pharmacy. And, yes, sometimes, sometimes, sad to say it, look at the faces of the people sitting next to you in the pew. Sometimes they don't convey on their faces that the Lord is their shepherd. Some years ago, I was watching a live-streamed Sabbath evening worship service from the General Conference headquarters. And the camera, see, sometimes you don't know when the cameras are on you. The cameras would pan the audience And as I looked at some of the faces, this was a worship service, Friday night, General Conference headquarters, and I looked at the faces of some of the worshipers, not all, but some. That year, um, in the World Series, the Boston Red Sox had beaten the um, St. Louis Cardinals. And I captured a, a, a picture of the St. Louis Cardinals who lost, and they were in the dugout watching the Red Sox celebrate their World Series victory. And so you can imagine that the faces on the losing team were were, were not jubilant. And they were standing there with arms crossed, looking very stoic, trying to be brave, realizing that they had lost the prize and the other team was celebrating and Their faces had that look, that look of defeat. And as I looked at some of the faces at that worship service, I turned to my wife and daughter and I says, hmm, looks like their team just lost. (laughs) It shouldn't be that way for the people of God, right? It shouldn't be that way for people who the Lord is their shepherd. Why do we look like that? Don't we have a shepherd? And if so, somebody needs to tell our faces. Psalms 34, verses 9 and 10. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack what? Nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Psalms 84, verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. You got cut off there at the bottom. Is blameless. Psalms 84, 11. So how do you have a blameless walk? Well, you follow the voice of the shepherd. That's how. There is rest for the stressed when you follow the shepherd's voice. We get off track and stressed out when we follow other voices, including those we hear in our own life-concussed heads. You know the voices I'm talking about, the ones telling you that you're no good, that you're not good enough that you'll never amount to anything, that the dreams that you have you won't be able to realize. But none of those voices are the voice of the shepherd. Can we hear his voice? What does he say about me? What does my shepherd say about me? Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. What does he say to us? Isaiah 43, verse 1, and also verses 4 and 5, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. You are precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. What is our shepherd saying about you this morning? John 10, verse 15, I laid down my life for you. John 10, 28 and 29, no one can snatch you out of my hand. 
No one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. I've got you. That assurance, those voices, that voice, the voice of the shepherd, is one that should give us calm. It should give us assurance. My sheep, he said, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. They listen, they follow. And as they follow the good shepherd, they have rest. If we are whacked out and stressed out and freaked out this morning, perhaps we're listening to the wrong voices. Whose sheep are we anyway? If the Lord is my shepherd, I am loved, redeemed, summoned, precious, and honored by the one who laid down his life for me and holds me in the iron grip of his grace so that no one can snatch me out of his hand. I have everything I need, and I am too blessed to be stressed. You're having trouble. You're having difficulty, aren't you? Because you live with stress. You live with anxiety. You're trying to figure out how this works. How this works that I have a shepherd who provides everything I need and I lack nothing. And yet, I wrestle. I'm not at ease. Everything starts with relationship. Intimacy, the shepherd knowing me and I knowing the shepherd and following his voice. Intimacy with the Almighty is the source of rest for the stressed. In that relationship, I have everything I need, protection, salvation, and provision. And that's why he says to us, come to me, all you who labor all you who are exhausted and weary from running like a hamster on a wheel and getting nowhere fast. Come to me, all you who are stressed out and burned out and bummed out and mentally checked out. Come to me, all who worry about everything and pray about too few things and who rise early and stay up late toiling to put food on the table. You who wear yourselves out to get ahead and trust in your own cleverness. Come to me, all you who are tired of trying to find me in all the wrong places, in the company of all the wrong people, because you've been listening to all the wrong voices. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you hear his voice today? Do you know him as your shepherd? If you do, then you know that whatever you, you know the answer to the question, whatever happened to hope? It's in knowing the Lord as your shepherd. That's where hope is found. And if you're still wondering the answer to the question, come to him and you will find rest too. You will find rest for your soul. Today was just the overview and we begin on our journey to finding rest for the stressed. And as we go on this summer vacation together, we'll piece together and look at the imagery of who this shepherd is and how it is that we can have rest even in the midst of our stressful world. I pray that you will enjoy the journey. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are. And if you don't know the shepherd, then it's time to know him. You may have known religion all your life. Let me tell you, there is a universe of difference between knowing religion and having a relationship with the shepherd. It's a vast difference. The people of Jesus' day were experts in religion. They had religion down like no one else. I defy you to find on the face of the earth a more religious people. And yet they did not know God. Did not know the shepherd. But some found him. Those who were outcasts. Those who were looked down upon, those who 
were poor in spirit and recognized their poverty, they knew the shepherd and they followed him. I don't know where you are today in your journey. But I want you to close your eyes with me and bow your heads for just a moment. Very simple appeal today, and that is, do you want to know the shepherd? Do you want to get to know him? If that's your desire, just raise your hand where you are. I, I want to know the shepherd. <laughs> Amen. I want to exchange a religious life for the life of a sheep <laughs> that is well cared for by the shepherd. If you're coming to know Jesus today for the first time and you say, you know what, I, I want to learn how to be a disciple of Christ. Raise your hand where you are. I want to be a disciple of Christ. Amen. Amen. God sees your hand. Amen. And he will give you the power to do it. And you won't have to do it alone. That's why you need a shepherd. <laughs> he'll see to it that you have a home with God. He'll see to it that you have everything you need. And he'll see to it that you have nothing to fear. It's a beautiful journey. And it begins today. Father, thank you for these who have raised their hands today. You know their hearts. And I pray, Father, that if they need to speak to someone about the next step in the journey that they'll do so and speak to me or to one of the elders on staff. But thank you for being our shepherd and thank you for coming by and spending time with us so that we could hear your voice. We prayed in the beginning through our song, Speak, O Lord. Shape and fashion us for your glory. We wanted to hear your voice that the light of Christ might be seen today and I pray, Lord, that that is exactly what has happened and that we have heard your voice. We are listening. And when we leave this place, don't let the listening stop. You have more to show us. You have more to teach us. So help us to follow you. From this day forward, all the way to your heavenly home. Thank you for loving us and for being with us today. We commit ourselves to you anew in Jesus' name. Amen. the end.